I'd like to go to Paul Marion Johnson so that she can um, do a roll call vote so that a quorum may be established. Thank you. Yes, uh, Chair Moore. Present. Vice Chair Brown. Present. Member Bradford. Member Grills. Present. Member Holder. Present. Member Joan Sawyer. Member Lewis. Present. Member Tamaki. Present. Member Montgomery Stepp. Here. Oh, I see. Okay. Here. Thank you. I Madam Chair, the task force consists of nine members. Five members are necessary for a quorum, and we have seven. A quorum is reestablished. Bradford is here. We have eight. A quorum is reestablished. Thank you. Thank you. Given that a quorum has been reestablished, we will reconvene. Our next item on the agenda is a potential action item subpoena request. Uh, we will have a presentation or update from members Holder and Tamaki. Uh, members Holder and Tamaki, you are both recognized. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. So when we last convened, uh, you all were gracious enough, enough to give uh, Member Tamaki and myself more time to figure out what sorts of materials we want to use our um, subpoena power uh, to compel uh, from government entities or other entities. And we have continued to investigate the subject matter areas that we think would be most useful to explore for purposes of this task force. And the subject matter area that we've landed on is, um, is criminal justice. Uh, you know, for, for the member Tamaki is going to go more into the specifics as to how we want to use our, our, our subpoena power or our power to compel information to increase transparency. But what I will say as an opener is that, you know, one of the things that we've heard from our panels and that we all know is that it's critical to collect data that is disaggregated by race. Um, that serves as a foundation for truly understanding disparate outcomes and being able to articulate biases as they exist currently and also to advocate to disrupt biases. So having data that's disaggregated by race is critical. Number two, as um, assembly as the assembly member mentioned yesterday, criminal justice is very much at the heart of the way that racism is manifesting today. And so the, we, we do want to center criminal justice in this uh, fact-finding process. So based on those two metrics, um, we have, Member Tamaki and I, um, after considering a host of subject matter areas, have landed on the issue of the Racial Justice Act and how to further the task of the Racial Justice Act, how to increase the impact of the Racial Justice Act by compelling, by compelling courts and district attorney's offices to provide more data, more transparency, more information, and also more systemic collection of data around the racial disparities in charging, the racial disparities in sentencing, the racial disparities in setting bail amounts, et cetera. And so with that introduction, I'm going to turn it over to Member Tamaki 
to talk specifically about the information that we're going to be compelling from governments and localities. So thank you, Lisa. I think Lisa Holder deserves credit for highlighting the fact that the task force under the legislation has powers of subpoena and has other powers to compel production of information from government entities or private parties. The challenges, however, we discussed with you at the last meeting, which is, you know, we sunset in June of 2023. We don't want to get mired in a litigation fight that would extend beyond the life of the task force. Um, we want to reveal information relevant to the mission of the task force. And as she, as Lisa pointed out, we want to draw attention to highlight historic or current examples of systemic racism in California so as to educate the public as to the existence of the task force and some of the issues that we are investigating. And so um, we've looked at, really Lisa spent hours, you know, looking at um, half a dozen or more areas that we might look to exercise the, this authority. And we've landed on the Racial Justice Act. Uh, part of our inquiry or, or the way we done it is sort of look to researchers and experts who are already in this field so we're not reinventing the wheel and asking them basically um, what are you doing and what kind of data do you need and in your search for data in your research uh, which happens to align with the task force's mission um, can we can we cooperate together and so we have been in communication with the ACLU and the State Public Defender's Office who are working to effectuate the California Racial Justice Act, which was passed in 2020 and made effective January 1 of 2022. Um, the legislative findings in the passage, uh, passage of the Racial Justice Act um, reveal uh, its purpose, and I'll just quote parts of it states, quote, we can no longer accept racial discrimination and racial disparities as inevitable in our criminal justice system. And we must act to make clear that this discrimination and these disparities are illegal and will not be tolerated in California. Um, so for example, if a black defendant can show that he has been charged more severely than similarly situated white defendants, charges can be dismissed or reduced uh, to mitigate that uh, disparity. So this goes to the heart of the uh, issue of mass incarceration. I'll quote another line, quote, it is, it is a further intent of the legislature to ensure that individuals have access to all relevant evidence, um, including statistical data. But in order to track disparities based upon race and, and ethnicity, uh, as Lisa pointed out, it is essential um, that the data be tracked. And without tracking race ethnicity data, much of the Racial Justice Act is probably uh, becomes meaningless. And there's no way to prove racial bias except in the most extreme and most blatant instances. So district attorneys have um, very widely in their approaches to data collection and how any data is collected can be accessed. For example, some offices uh, state they do not collect uh, race ethnicity data uh, despite the Racial Justice Act or, or a person's act or the victims of these uh, crimes as well. Um, district attorneys who are collecting the data, uh, some have refused to provide it and uh, some uh, have been slow to provide uh, much information about it. Um, superior courts are also collecting race and ethnicity data. And to date, at least two courts uh, have refused to turn that over. Um, so what are the next steps? Um, we will work with the Department of Justice Research Center to survey district attorney's offices and the courts of 58 counties and require them to disclose what data points are tracked or not tracked. That is to say in connections with arrest, bail, charges, reductions, diversion, plea offers, dismissal of charges, strikes or other enhancements, convictions, acquittals, 
sentencing and so on. Um, we will require the production of data that is being tracked. And if they are not tracking the data, require responses from the district attorney and the courts as to whether they plan to track such data. And if not, why not? Uh, and we'll make that information because it will become part of the public record available for researchers, policymakers, and advocates. So that information will be, will be around long after the task force um, term ends. And in this process, um, work with our communications consultants to educate uh, the public and inform the press of the importance of this data collection. So this is a feature of, of the legislation which uh, allows us to compel this kind of evidence. And um, under the uh, guidance of the Department of Justice, um, not only are subpoenas available, but also surveys. And with respect to state agencies like county councils and the Judicial Council, which oversees the courts, um, those are state agencies and are required to respond to surveys. One of the benefits of the survey is that we can fashion questions um, so that we get narrative responses. It, so it's not just a yes or a no. Um, I do wanna uh, mention and it, it at least address our um, consideration and sensitivity to what Assembly Member Joan Sawyer had, had cautioned us about. And that is, you know, in these times of COVID and where state agencies are already overwhelmed, um, you know, this better be a worthwhile endeavor. Um, we ought not to, you know, go into this willy nilly. Um, and we ought to make it efficient and not waste anybody's time. So some of these questions, I think we're proposing at least the first round be simple easy to answer and not, you know, reams of paper and not voluminous. Uh, we didn't want to get into an area that would produce, you know, um, thousands and thousands of pages of data uh, that we would have to plow through. So I, I think the initial inquiry is first to find out who is collecting the data, why not, if, you, if they're not, what do they plan to do? And <clears throat> we see this, as a first step to um, the steps that are, we think are really necessary to effectuate the Racial Justice Act and its meaning, and then also to educate the public uh, about the issues of disparity in sentencing and in charging and so on that is, we think, core to the, the mission of the task force. So with that, I'll just stop here and maybe ask Lisa, did you wanna add anything? That's basically our overview, but maybe Lisa, if you have anything to add, that would be great. Yeah, as far as the substance, I think Don did a great job of explaining what we're trying to get at to disrupt mass criminalization and mass incarceration and elevate the Racial Justice Act that already exists to do that. We're giving them more tools to make that happen faster and more efficiently. Um, the only other thing that I that I would add is that you know, we we talked we had a conversation several conversations about you know being able to show the public some wins along the way and uh, low hanging fruit that we can that we can uh, publicize to show the work that the task force is doing the the way that we are suggesting that we utilize our power to to uh, le leveraging our power to give the Racial Justice Act more teeth and pre-existing legislation that seeks to get, to disrupt mass incarceration and mass criminalization, that is a win that's, that we can very easily encapsulate and uh, publicize through the media and through other uh, resources um, to, you know, to, 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 to show that this task force is dynamic and that there's, there's a process where we are, we are hitting benchmarks along the way. Yeah, and to add to Chair 
Moore's point about early wins and low hanging fruit, you know, the list so far will be, you know, the report, which will be part one of the report, which will be released in June. Um, Professor Grills' uh, community engagement pro project leading um, in behalf of the task force. Uh, the, the issuance of, of, of this survey to district attorneys and courts in 58 counties, and of course in June of 2023, the report itself uh, for part two. Uh, but there may be other things um, that can, can demonstrate um, the importance of the task force and put it before um, our existence before the public and also contribute to completing our, our mission or fulfilling our mission. Is there any questions from task force members that we can answer? I, I, <clears throat> I don't have a, a, a question, but I, I, I'm going to volunteer uh, myself and uh, State Senator uh, Stephen Bradford. Um, this task force is in a unique situation where you have the chairs of Public Safety Senate and the chair of Public Safety Assembly at, who are on this line. We also have um, Public Safety staff that if you need help as far as doing some research or getting to the bottom of things, uh, I am offering not only my staff, but I'm also going to offer the Senate staff. In addition, I believe the, uh, the chairman, uh, Assembly Member Mark Stone, is really aligned with what we're doing and believes in what we're doing. Uh, so I'm going to, I haven't talked to him yet, but I will volunteer any staff that he has. And I'm talking about, these are all lawyers. In addition to working with DOJ, um, that could possibly help in our ability to, to not only ferret out information, but maybe be able to shine a light on where to look under what rocks that they're hiding this information. Uh, they may have already started down this path and we don't have to reinvent the wheel. And so I have, I've just offered <laughs> my staff and I volunteered <laughs> Senator Bradford's staff and I've now volunteered a Senate member Stone staff. Um, we're probably talking about 15 to 20 lawyers in addition to what you have with the DOJ. Can I add also <clears throat> that we've had lengthy conversations and communications with Michael Newman of the Department of Justice, Senior Assistant Attorney General. And uh, he is, you couldn't have been more cooperative and, assist and helpful in this process. And, and so um, we talked about how difficult it would be to put together the survey and um, how long it might take and when we could expense, expect responses and it should it go to a targeted group of counties or all 58. And so we've had those uh, discussions, I think that would be very helpful. The question I would ask Michael is, uh, we don't wanna create any violations of Bagley Keene and um, you know, Lisa and I uh, are a, a sort of an advisory committee of just two. And so by doing so, we didn't create any any issues. Uh, I would love for um, uh, Assembly Member uh, Joan Sawyer and Senator Bradford to g get involved in this, but we need to do it in a way where we're not communicating and inadvertently, I guess, Michael Newman creating a public meeting. And I'd be happy to pop out of the process, for example, to allow others to participate, but I, I think we're on to something. And it's been both uh, Assembly uh, Member John Sawyer and Senator Bradford that have, have been in this for many years. So, uh, you know, we'd love to have you involved directly. And you know more about this than certainly I do. So I, I think my role is just to sort of help get the ball rolling. And then to the extent that without violating Bagley Keene, we can get other members involved, but not communicating cross lines if that's possible. I think that would be terrific, if that makes sense. 
Um, I don't know if that's a question to me, uh, but I will go ahead and answer it. Uh, so we'll we'll look into this question. Um, I I think that what would be doable um, is for DOJ staff to communicate with, with ledge staff. Um, that's certainly doable, and um, you know to avoid having you know any kind of serial communication or anything like that. Uh, we can facilitate that. I'll look into whether there is an alternative to the creation of a subcommittee um, to allow that to happen, or if you know if there is an option where um, you know you would step out, um, or there would be a separate um, advisory committee that would work on the sort of the execution of information requests through leg, leg, the legislature or something like that. Um, there are a couple of different ways we could do it, um, but I appreciate you raising that concern. Thank you. It's a long way of saying it's doable. I think Mr. Bradford wants to talk. I think so. I think you asked, since Mr. Jones Sawyer has volunteered me, I'm just here to say I will avail myself to the best of my ability. I love it. I'll, I'll, uh, the clock the die has been cast, so I'll be more than happy to assist where I can. I will have to check with the legalities of what degree my committee staff engage, but if there's no um, challenges there, I'll be more than happy to use those resources as well. Thank you. And just one other comment, maybe to Professor Grills. I'm, I'm wondering if, if this is something we can communicate with the communications consultant uh, consultants as this thing shapes forward, and um, this could part be part of the outreach to the public as to what the task force is doing. Are there any other questions or comments or insights from members Tamaki and member Grills? Uh, I'm sorry, I was answering. I didn't realize I was on mute um, to, to, to uh, member Tamaki's question. But in terms of the communications firms, I think this is definitely something that would fall within the area and scope of work for them. And in fact, they, um, I believe, are planning to reach out um, sometime in the near future to each task force member to discern opportunities for media um, um, uh, processes. So, yes. So members Tamaki and member Grills, um, are we prepared to move on this item or to, you know, the motion on the floor related to this item? So at the last meeting, December 8th, um, the motion was already approved to do th two things. One, to allow us to continue to explore areas so we could figure out if there was a viable, susceptible subject matter to work on. And then secondly, uh, the authority was placed in member holder to actually proceed to go forward. So I don't believe any further authorization is needed. So this is, in essence, more of a report to the task force. Okay, great. Um, are, is there any other questions or comments or insights related to this um, item on the agenda? Okay, thank you. I want to personally thank members Tamaki and member Grills for your hard work um, on this issue. I'm looking forward to seeing how it materializes. So excuse now, excuse me, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. uh, Chairman, I'm Chairwoman. I just wanted to correct the record. This is not me and um, Tamaki, Member Tamaki. It's Member Holder and Tamaki. Oh, I apologize. I don't know why I keep saying Member Girls. Sorry. Um, I would like to personally thank Member Holder, especially, and Member Tamaki for the hard work you've been doing behind the scenes around this issue, definitely. Thank you so much for that correction. 
So now what we're going to do is we have to move the unfinished business portion. We have to advance that uh, discussion item ahead of um, the item where we're discussing future meetings of the task force, uh, which is the pre presentation between myself and member Scott Lewis, because uh, the unfinished business probably will inform um, the schedule for the future meetings of the task force. So now we're, we're going to discuss unfinished business and there's two parts of, of unfinished business and one part actually directly relates to what we were just discussing in terms of the media consultant that we've just hired. And so um, in previous meetings, the Department of Justice has you know, handled um, most of all of the, actually the press inquiries and have sent them to me where I've tried to filter to other task force members or handle them myself. And so I wanted to discuss and maybe someone can put a motion on the floor where we can actually have the new um, media coordinator that we just hired, the new media consultant form that we just hired, kind of take that job from the DOJ, right? And so they can be like our secretary, our media secretary, um, and all press inquiries will go through them. And then they will reach out to us as it relates to any inquiries that come in to the task force. Madam Chair, I move that we um, place the measure of the media uh, consultant being hired. Is there a second? Excuse me. I second. Okay, great. So it has been properly moved in and seconded that the media coordinator that we just hired will handle, um, will have the responsibility for handling all the media requests on behalf of the task force as a whole. Is there any discussion on this matter? Uh, member girls, you are recognized. Yes, uh, just for a point of clarification that when we're saying that they're going to handle media requests, it means that they're going to manage the requests and triage um, the requests to different task force members, as well as give insights to the task force members about the particular media outlet that is seeking an interview. But they will not be the spokespersons for the uh, task force because they don't want to do that. They feel that it's better to have the task force members be the, the face, but that they can help to field like this would probably be a good one for you know, um, Senator, you know, Bradford, this would be a better one for the chair, et cetera, and then give us any background information you might need about that outlet. Yeah, absolutely, exactly. Thank you for that clarification. Are there any other questions, comments, discussion on the matter? Just a uh, uh, question for clarification. So if we receive uh, media requests outside of the DOJ, we just forward them to the media consulting and then uh, have them disperse it. Or, I mean, I think that that um, let me actually not just talk out of turn because I'm not a communications expert. So why don't I ask that question um, of the communications firms? We have a meeting with them next week on Friday. Um, and I, I'll get their counsel and um, share it back with DOJ so they can share it with the entire task force on what the best process is for things like that. Okay, sounds good. Thank you. And if I could just add, you know, since we're talking specifically about this and you're going to be meeting with the, the communications team, um, if you could just inquire of them whether there's a set of talking points that they are going to be formulating, whether they think the best approach is that we as a uniform body follow those talking points. I just want to get a sense uh, about that as well. Uh, you know, about their, their ideas about us speaking as a collective uh, around, around the, the, the work that we're doing. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, it, you went out on my end. I think it's my, something on my side. So I only heard the end of your sentence. So I'm sorry, would you repeat it for me? No worries. No, I just, I know that you're going to be speaking with the communications team. So I just wanted to 
get some clarity from them um, as to whether they are going to be putting together talking points for the task force to use when we're speaking to the media, whether they think that we should be speaking to the media in our individual capacity or as in our, in our collective capacity and utilizing the talking points that they formulate, just to sort of get a, a, a sense of their strategic plan around that issue. I, yeah, I will definitely ask them. I know that in the last meeting with them, they talked about um, preparing um, materials packets for all of the anchor orgs um, so that there was kind of consistency of message, um, et cetera. So I will ask them about that to make sure if that will be sufficient for us or if we would need something in addition and if they would prepare it for us. Right, that's and perfect. If I can say one thing, Chair Moore, I mean, <clears throat> that may depend upon the specific activity. So, for example, the, the, the issuance of a survey to compel, you know, information from the D district attorney's offices may have its own talking points. Uh, the report, certainly in June of 2022, that's a big deal uh, that we all ought to sort of get on the same page on in terms of how we amplify that. Um, if we pursue Senator Bradford's idea of, of having a meeting in the Central Valley and and taking a field trip out at, to Allensworth, or what was Allensworth, um, that in itself is, you know, something, a great opportunity to educate the California public. So that would have its own uh, talking points. So it may, may be that the consultants will have to communicate separately with individual members uh, to get framing on some of these issues as they come up. Member girls, I'm wondering, is there a way for us to, you know, put a face to the name, so to speak, where the consultant company can maybe come to a future task force meeting and just kind of introduce themselves, um, maybe do a report back of what they plan to do, um, as it relates to what we're talking about now, but just in, in, in general as well. I think that would be helpful. Yeah, so if you just ag agendize it, um, mm -hmm. then I can put the, the ask in. Okay, great. We'll discuss that later. So are there any other questions, comments on this discussion item? Hearing no further discussion, I will go to Parliamentarian Johnson so that she can establish a roll call vote on the motion. Thank you. I'm calling the roll call vote on the motion on regarding the media coordinator who will handle media uh, request as clarified by Member Grills. Chair Moore? Aye. Chair Moore votes aye. Vice Chair Brown? Aye. Vice Chair Brown votes aye. Member Bradford? Member Bradford? I think he's frozen. I'll go back to him. Um, Member Grills? Aye. Member Holder? Aye. Member Bradford? Aye. Thank you. Member Jones Sawyer? Member Lewis? Aye. Member Tamaki? Aye. Member Montgomery Stepp? Aye. Madam Chair, there were eight members voting, eight ayes, no nays, and one not voting. Thank you. So was your eight eyes. This is Bradford. Was my vote recorded? Yes, it was, sir. Um, Member Joan Sawyer is the one that is he. No. Thank you. Thank you. So there were eight eyes, zero nays. Did you say there was one not voting? There were. That's correct. Okay, so there are eight ayes, zero nays, and one not voting. The motion carries as the ayes have it. 
So the next um, part of the unfinished business is a carryover from the discussion that we had yesterday, um, where uh, lead member Holder uh, put a motion on the floor. And so um, I would like to just go back to member Holder for her to kind of restate the motion um, and we can have a discussion. Member Holder, you're recognized. Thank you. I'll begin. I'm gonna I'm gonna based on the discussion that we have with the Secretary of State. I'm going to go ahead and withdraw the motion unless there's some objection. Um, but I, I do want to say for the record, especially after hearing the testimony that we had today from mental health experts across the board about the experience of trauma that all Black people in the United States are facing and about the way that that trauma of racism to all Black people is landing on us physically and changing our physiologies. Given that backdrop, I think, number one, this body and the public that is helping to buttress this body, as black people and as brown people, etc., we need to recognize how much trauma we have all experienced. And that this process that we are engaging in is a traumatic experience for us. And we need to take care of each other, tread lightly with one another, and treat each other with dignity. The second thing I want to say is that it's so important, and I'll say this as a scholar, as an educator, and you know, as someone who's a trained attorney who's been litigating for over 20 years. It's so important that we think critically, that we bring our experience, our education, our lived experience to bear when we are engaging of a process like when we are engaging a process like this of such monumental historical importance. And so to the extent that we bring that experience, that background to bear in terms of interrogating this process and challenging one another and thinking critically about how to create the instruments for reparations, that that not be deemed a threat, that that not be deemed a form of paralysis. Because in the end, that in level of engagement, that level of interrogation, and that democratic process that we are engaging in by thinking critically around these issues of such importance is what's going to make our recommendations stronger, better, and more viable. And with that, I will withdraw the motion. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, yes. Uh, in withdrawing the motion, there was a seconder that needs to withdraw their second because it became a part of the House once it was made and seconded. So whoever the seconder was will need to do Please that. Member Grills. Thank yes, you. I, yes. I'm not, I was not prepared to withdraw that motion. Um, and so I'm going to be thinking out loud here. Um, I, and I want to start by saying I really appreciate what, what Member Holder was sharing. Um, I 
fully embrace what she was sharing, that, you know, for us to raise questions about things is to simply be doing our due diligence. And we shouldn't then have to be attacked or character assassinated or suggested that we would be withdrawn from the task force or be called anything but a child of God because we're trying to do our due diligence. We were brought onto this task force to do a job. We're trying to do that job and we don't need 100% agreement. That doesn't mean you're a villain if you don't have 100% agreement. Now, that being said, let me explain what my, what my vote um, was about. And it's very simple. Let me start with, I have nothing against Kirsten Mullen. I think she's a delightful woman. I think she's a, a gifted and talented woman. I actually have a one-on-one -on -one with her and um, uh, Professor Darity. And I, and I found it to be a very engaging and enjoyable conversation. But I raised the question, we are dealing with a very, very complicated thing that they have to accomplish in terms of the, the two tasks for the economists on this task force. And if, um, if we are going to get the results that we need, I'm looking for people who are bringing a particular expertise, whether that is strictly in economics or closely related to economics, where you have the skill set to create the models, to do the calculations, and to understand the way to communicate this, both technically to other economists who are going to pick it apart, and to the general public. And so when I start thinking about those things, it makes me wonder if Ms. Mrs. Mullen was not associated with Professor Darity, would we be considering her to be on the panel of econ economists? Or should we be trying to bring in additional talent with the background and technical expertise for that role? And then the other reason that I, I, I voted, I seconded the motion, was because it's not still clear to me how this panel of economists and others are going to function and operate. And as a task force, I feel we have a responsibility to know what we are about to support and, and, and authorize. And so what we don't know is what is their process going to be? Is there going to be, and I've led enough research teams over my 30, 40 years doing research to know you just don't throw a group of people together and say, produce a product. There has to be some kind of strategy and structure that they're following. I have no clue what that is. And so I just kind of wanted to understand this before I co-signed something. And again, it was only out of my sense of responsibility to do the due diligence. So that all being said, if my other task force members are comfortable with having someone in that panel of, of economists and I guess a political scientist uh, who does not have the, the technical background, not to say they don't have a contribution to make, and I can see the chatter just blowing up, I'm not reading it, but please stop and listen for a minute before you start reacting, right? So if the rest of my task force members are comfortable with that, Ashe. And if the rest of my task force members are comfortable with not knowing how our economists are going to organize themselves, then Ashe. Thank you for that, uh, Member Grills and Member Holder. Um, I, I hear you and I actually agree with you all wholeheartedly. I think due diligence is important and um, no one's character should be assassinated or put into question, um, you know, given that people have legitimate answers and questions and, you know, people's intentions shouldn't be questioned either. We're doing this for free, to your point. Um, we're putting in massive amounts of time and labor. This is a labor of love. And so I just wanted to, you know, kind of reciprocate what you're feeling, I feel as well. So um, 
you know, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> remember, remember Scott Lewis, you're recognized. Uh, thank you, Chair Moore, but uh, Member Montgomery Step had her hand up early. Go after. Did you not? You can go ahead. I'll, I'll go after you. That's cool. You sure. Okay, I yeah. appreciate it. Okay. Um, I, I wanted to I wanted to <clears throat> follow up on Member Grill's comment um, and provide a little bit of broader contextualization. Um, given that I think of all of the task force members, I am perhaps the closest to the discipline of economics. Um, here at UC Berkeley, I co-chair the Economic Disparities Research Cluster, which is populated with some of the world's top uh, economists. A few of them have won Nobel Prizes in economics. Um, uh, Professor Robert Reich, who many of you might know, is also a part of this cluster that I lead. So when we're dealing with the question of economics, there is a disciplinary challenge. And the issue is that <clears throat> The qualitative component of the lived experience of people oftentimes gets filtered out through the mechanism by which economic analysis is conducted. And today's testimony alone shows us the power of narrative, right? A couple of our speakers today talked about the lie that was told about black people and the way that the lie gets perpetuated and becomes structural and has led to the centuries of inequality, disparity, and violence that Black people in this country have faced. And so <clears throat> I, behind the scenes, was doing my bit to try and find, um, you know, an economist or individuals who could be uh, qualified to take the place of Professor Hamilton. And there is a big challenge just with the job itself. There's a great deal of conservatism in the economics discipline, meaning what we are asking somebody to do is perhaps the bravest task in economics that perhaps has existed, which is that we are asking an economist or a team of economists quantify centuries of injury. And the truth is that regardless of the skill set of the various economists who I try to approach, and I've sent many emails. I've gotten very few to no, actually no responses for the people who I was trying to highlight, is that there's a lack of bravery, just to put it plainly, right? Regardless of the skill set, people do not want to be the individual responsible for putting that number out into the world. And so I, I think when we're looking at people like, you know, Professor Darity, Ms. Mullen, Dr. Kramer, right, you have to also con consider just the sheer commitment that these individuals have to the kind of justice-oriented purpose of that task, even though it might ultimately feel like it's a mathematical project, it is so much more than just that. And so, you know, with Ms. Mullen in, in, in particular, given her role as a folklorist, what is injury? What are the injuries that we are trying to account for? We need as much of a mathematical model as we need a qualitative sense of the history, a qualitative sense of the really complicated ways that that history has played out in order to factor that into the actual economic modeling. And so I think, you know, the, the, the people who are being proposed ultimately are very well suited um, because of these exact issues that I'm raising now. And so I, I, I think, you know, while I have a lot of appreciation for um, the, the, the position, you know, as a member of the Economic Disparities Research Cluster, I personally often struggle to communicate this simple fact to colleagues. Right? When someone is trying to explain that the experience of poverty isn't just how much money they bring in and how much money they, you know, spend on a monthly basis or however regular we're talking about, but the very quality of money, what it means to have it, what it means to spend it. You know, those kinds of things have to be incorporated into these calculations. And so we do need, I think, a team that, 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 is, that is representative enough from a disciplinary standpoint, but also, I think, more importantly, from, you know, from the standpoint of a commitment, who, who, who will be willing to put themselves out there to actually make the brave choice of making a claim. And that's what we're here to deal with, right? We're, we're dealing with, you know, all of us are engaged in a very brave act of trying to make claims on the behalf of people for whom claims were denied for centuries. And so I think we need to make sure that the economics team is willing to be, you know, 
you know, inclined to do the same work as we are. Chair Moore, Madam Chair, I yes. just want to clarify that as Dr. Grills, I didn't hear her withdraw her, her second. Therefore, just to take it back a step, just to be clear that we are still talking about the motion that was made by Lisa Holder that is on the floor. So I wanted to make sure all of the members were clear on that. That motion is still on the floor and that's what we are discussing. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. uh, Member Montgomery Step, are you available now? Yes, I'm here. Thank you, Chair. Um, I I really appreciate the discussion and I, I um having very uh limited knowledge about economists um I kind of assumed some of what member Lewis just said uh just about the challenge that we would have it, it's not like we would have an open market of folks that would be willing to to do this and so that's where my thought process was, but I will also I will also say that I think not having the scope of work or not having discussed that or not having that as a part of our discussion when it came before us and already having you know um, the names, which by the way I I am um, okay with, but um, not having the scope, I could see how that'd be a major issue for us because as Member Grill said, we don't. And so even even if it were a an exercise in um, in education, <laughs> we don't really know. I can say I don't really know what the next steps are, um, what's going to happen, what our expectation is. And we know we need a number, but you know, uh, but outside of that, there was not really a lot of process that went along with the way that it came forward to us. So I think that may add to some of the um, some of what we're dealing with now. So. I, I I do recall that the DOJ's first recommendation was that we we um, send out these letters of retention that that are not tracks and that we discuss the scope of work, um, which I would be okay with. Um, so I, I just wanted to throw that in there that I I think every I I definitely understand where everyone is coming from. Um, and the way that it came to us as a task force, of, of course, although not intentionally, it may have spurred some additional confusion. Thank you. That's all. Thank you for that, um, um, members. Yes, uh, Member Grills. And then I want to go to Attorney Newman, who can maybe speak to the process issue. Uh, Member Grills. Thank you. So I just want to say this is why we have conversation, this is why we have discussion. And that's a good thing. It does not mean we are the enemy. And so, Member Scott Lewis, I appreciate your argument. And that has moved my position. And so I, I, I wholeheartedly agree. Now, um, I also agree with Member uh, Step, Montgomery Step, that, you know, we need to know about their process. And so I am, just so that we're clear now, um, so that our parliamentarian who is keeping us on track uh, understands, I am willing to withdraw, I mean, to also, as a second, withdraw the motion, uh, convinced by or informed by the perspective of um, Member Scott Lewis uh, and Member Step, Montgomery Step, uh, with, the, with the caveat that when we come to our next meeting, then we should have some have on our agenda some discussion about what their process is going to entail. So did you withdraw the mo motion or you said we're still we're I said withdrawing her second. Okay. I'm withdrawing the second. The second. Okay. okay. Attorney Newman. Um, sure. Um, yes, Chair Moore, I, I can speak to that. So I, I really appreciate the discussion. I, you know, I will say that I really appreciate the discussion and that certainly helps us in coordinating the process of coordinating the experts. Um, the idea here, I think moving forward, because it is a, it's a very complicated question. The, the process is essentially going to be because the task force has to make 
all of the ultimate decisions um, as to who should get reparations, what form reparations should take, and how those reparations should be allocated. Those are all exclusively the decision of the task force as a whole. And they are not gonna be the decision of the experts, no matter who the experts are, um, or no matter what the experts' positions may be. Their opinions are their own, um, but the task force's opinion is what governs. You are in charge of what ultimately becomes the recommendation to the legislature provided for under AB, uh, under the law. Um, the issue is, uh, as member Scott Lewis has, has delineated and as are you all, seem to be keenly aware, the process of getting to that is going to be very complicated and unlike most expert retention uh, processes, because what will need to happen is, in order to provide the task force with all the information you all need in order to make the decisions, you need the advice of the experts, and then you will need to make the decisions, and then the experts will need to go and do the calculations and make the final sort of recommendations to you about what your recommendation should be. That's kind of a two-part process. Um, the answers are not in the statute, they're in your ultimate decision making. Um, so I definitely think that having this discussion um, is critical. There's a couple ways the task force can do that, and that's one of the reasons why the chair advanced this to before you all take up the question of what happens in the future meetings or how they're scheduled. Um, the obviously, there's a, a quite a bit of conversation, discussion, and decisions that need to be made. Some of those before the scope of work is actually ready to be presented to the task force to vote on. Um, in order to do that, uh, the task force can, as my usual uh, guidance is, designate somebody to work with the experts um, to develop a scope of work that includes this sort of three-part process where the experts present options to the task force, the task force makes a decision about what their direction should be, and then the experts carry out that direction. Um, you could also have an advisory committee that essentially works with the experts, but everything comes back to the task force for discussions like these and a final vote for direction. Um, or you can take it up <clears throat> as a task force as a whole where these discussions would happen in open meetings like these uh, between all the members and the, um, and the members of the uh, expert group. Uh, and that would have to be in open meetings. And so that's why it really does affect what your future meeting schedule would be like. Because if you have that discussion, it, it, it would seem like it may require some significant dedicated time in the meetings. So those are sort of your option. Those are your three options for moving forward. And just to be clear about where we are in the process, this is the process for developing the scope of work. And then ultimately for figuring out how the process will work for execution of that scope of work, meaning when things will come back to the task force, when the task force will make a decision, and just keeping everybody in mind of the ultimate um, deadline. This all needs to take place in such a way that it allows the experts enough time to actually craft their recommendations for you for a final report that would be done by um, July of July 1 of 2023. I know that was a lot. I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Oh, you're on mute, Chair Moore. Madam Chair. Yes, Vice Chair Brown, you're recognized. I, I call for the for the agenda, the question. There, there's no motion. Hey, pardon? There's no motion on the floor. No, I didn't say motion, I said the agenda. Okay, you orders of the day? Okay. <laughs> she he wants you to go back to the agenda item. We're at Which agenda. 
you're at agenda 20 item 22 which is what they're discussing right um so are we calling to stop this this discussion to go to something else yeah. no we can't do that he wants he wants you to clarify where you are on the agenda. Right. We are on unfinished business, which has to occur before we get to item 22, because this unfinished business will inform the next agenda item, which is the schedule for future meetings of the task force. So I'll just restate or re-clarify where we're at as um, as it pertains to what Attorney Newman stated. So essentially what we can do is at our next agenda, I mean, at our next meeting, we could put on the agenda to bring all these potential consultants into the room so that we can learn more about them um, and their qualifications. But with, the, with that caveat, that'll take a significant amount of time. Um, and so an alternative, what Attorney Newman is suggesting is that we set up an advisory committee of two um, task force me members to work alongside with the California Department of Justice Research Center um, so that you know, this advisory committee would work with these potential consultants um, offline, so to speak, to develop the scope of work, which that's for, for approval for a vote. And so that's kind of where we're, we are right now. But I just, before we just move on to do a motion, I, I want to just um, clarify who we're talking about, right? So you have uh, Sandy Darity and Kirsten Mullen. So Sandy Darity and Kirsten Mullen um, were hired by the Department of Justice before this panel was impaneled to help and guide their research with the report. Um, Sandy Darity and Kirsten Mullen also have written the book, From Here to Equality, reparations for black Americans in the 21st century. And I believe that book is one of the reasons why the California Department of Justice um, decided to reach out to them for a consultant position um, before we were in panel. And so the other person in consideration to be a part of this economic team is William Spriggs. So William Spriggs was also, um, he, he provided expert testimony um, at our task force meeting last year in October. And uh, William Spriggs was also um, the chair of Howard University's um, economics department, um, the assistant secretary for labor and policy under Obama's administration. And he's currently the chief economist at the AFL-CIO. Um, and um, the third economist we have um, as potential as a potential uh, member of the team is Casia Campbell, the Black American woman who is an economist and works at Pierce College. Um, and the California Department of, of uh, Justice Research Center has already met with her and has had some conversations with her, and she has expressed interest in being a part of the team. And then the last person, so that's Darity Mullen, Spriggs, Casey Campbell, and then Thomas Kramer. So Thomas Kramer is a professor of public policy at the University of Connecticut. And he's actually done some research, um, past research on the issue of reparations with Darity and Mullen before. So of those five people, right, three are economists, Darity, Mullen, and Casia Campbell, I mean, sorry, Darity Spriggs and Casia Campbell. Uh, Kramer is a professor of public policy and Mullen is a folklorist. So essentially, this team would comprise of three economists, one public policy professor, and one folklorist. And I guess I'll contrast that, that team to what we were considering before, um, which was, or which was Derek Hamilton uh, from the New School. And um, I believe we approved to have him as an economic consultant before we, we actually received his scope of work. And so I only say that to say, you know, this, this isn't really much different other than we're considering more than one person for this team. Um, and so essentially 
again, just to um, recap what, what we would need to do to move this item forward, um, it's either we create an advisory board committee that will work alongside the research center um, and with these five people, help develop a scope of work so that the scope of work can be presented at our next task force meeting, or, you know, we vote to say, you know, let's, let's hear about their individual qualifications um, at the next meeting um, and, and approve of them then, but then that might take some significant time, which would then, um, after that, we would also have to kind of do another step of approving a scope of work. Um, so um, that's, that's, that's where we're at. Um, Attorney Newman, does that sound um, right to you? Um, that does, and I think just to clarify, if there is not sort of an advisory committee that's reporting back to the task force, then yes, in a future meeting, you know, you would you would evaluate each of the members of the team, and then have to work through a scope of work um, in order to then be able to consider the scope of work as a sort of a committee of the whole of the entire task force. Madam Chair. Is Vice Chair Brown, you're recognized. Why, why can't we consider a committee of three, you as the chair, and two other persons from the task force? That I believe that would, sorry, that would be a subcommittee, right, Attorney Newman, and that would, um, Bagley Key provisions would apply to a committee of yeah, three but or you, four. But what you mentioned was five. Oh yeah, that five five economists. Oh well, five people on the I team. Thought, yeah, on no, I thought you said five on the committee. The committee that will work along with this team is to be vetted. So to and clarify, mm -hmm. so what would need to happen would be we would need to create an advisory committee of two task force members. To work with the research center so that these five people that we're considering on the um, economic consultant team uh, will develop the scope of work like independent of this 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 meeting space so essentially dr brown i don't know if you're trying to make a motion for an advisory committee of two people um to develop this I'm, work i move that the, the committee of two um, and, and you as ex official chair would be third person. If, 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 uh, Mr. if you do that, if you have a committee of three, you will have a subcommittee which will have to be noticed and it will be subject to the Bagley Keen Act. So you'd have to give the 10 days notice if you have a subcommittee. If you have two members, you do not. It will be an advisory committee, period. And that advisory committee will be tasked with working with those recommended individuals consisting of, what is it, four, four teams or four, four individuals. I think it's two, one, one, and one. So your task will be to work with that group to come up and develop a, um, a, a um, scope of work which will be brought back by that advisory committee with those individual members, you know, assist or at the meeting to answer your questions. And then you will vote on the acceptance of that scope of work, which will allow you to move in the direction you're seeking to do. Uh, Madam Chair again. Yes, Vice Chair Brown. I'm confused. I thought this matter of not more than three members of the committee applying only to this task force, not a subcommittee that is working as an advisory group to the general task force. May I, Madam Chair? If you have a, a subcommittee is subject to the Bagley Keene Act, if you have three or more people, period. So if you have three or more people, all of the all of the provisions of the Bagley King Act will apply. You have to notice it, 
you have, you know, you, you can't, you know, talk outside of the group, all of that. But if you have two members of the task force, as you've done in the past, where you have set and voted on advisory, a, an advisory committee with any two, no more than two, then that two can be tasked with what the task force wants them to do. What I'm hearing that you want them to do is to meet with the individuals that were recommended by the research center and you want them to develop a scope of work. And that scope of work, when they do that, it will be a report that they will bring back to the full task force. And then you will review that when they, when, when the two advisory members report back, just as uh, member Tamaki and member Holder did when they reported back, you will, you will look at that. And if they have something in writing, that writing will be presented as a materials, just as you've done with others. And you will discuss that and then you will vote on it. You know, the acceptance well, or not acceptance. Well, or you'll send I, them back I with move, other direction. Well, I, I move that we, we choose two persons from the task force to be that committee. Okay, is there a second? So there's no second. I I I I'll second um and I think um member Holder's hand was up but I do have some questions afterwards so I will second for now and I have Okay so it has been properly moved and seconded that a two member advisory board committee is established to work alongside the Department of Justice Research Center to help develop the scope of work um with the five individuals named. Member Holder, you had a question. Uh, no, is there gonna be a call for discussion or do we just go to vote? No, you discuss. Oh, well, there's a call for discussion. So you had a question. Oh, okay. So what, what I will say um, is that I'm going to vote no, and this is why. Uh, I, the, unlike the subpoena committee or the subpoena advisory, you know, committee or the language linguistics advisory committee, those are collateral issues. I think that this issue of the scope of work of the economists is, is probably one of the most fundamental undertakings of this task force. And I think we need to decide what that scope of work will be as a collective body with total transparency. Um, I know that will take up some time, but given the primacy of that task, then we need to dedicate the time to that. So that is why I'm going to vote no to Dr. Brown's motion of having just two advisors work on the scope of work with the, with the economists. Um, thank you for that. Member Lewis, you're recognized. Thank you, Chair Moore. Um, I agree with Member Holdo, um, because in principle, the scope of work would have to be guided by some fundamental issues that we've not yet decided. Um, in principle, is that we have to have a formal decision about the uh, terms of eligibility. There's no way that the economics team would be able to go forward and do any amount of work without any formal guidance from the task force um, on the issue of eligibility. And, uh, and I'm thankful for Secretary, Secretary of State uh, Dr. Weber coming uh, to our meeting yesterday and basically making things you know, fairly clear for us. But as a task force, we have to, you know, Dr. Weber has given us the authority to make that decision finally. And so we need to, you know, with that guidance in mind, with her guidance in mind, we need to make state state that definitively. Um, at that point, we can tell, you know, we can we can finally come up with the scope of work for the economists. But we we have to know, and in decided manner, the the terms of eligibility for the scope of work to even be considered. So I think there might be at some point where 
uh, an advisory committee can be formed, but we first have to make make these decisions. Um, you know, my sense is that it has largely been you know concluded, but we need to, as a task force, actually vote. I think on the terms of eligibility in order for any forward work to, to uh, be undertaken by the economist team. Thank you, member Tamaki, you're recognized. So that, that same um, thing occurred to me that the economists will want to know what the task force's universe of eligibility and criteria are before they then develop it. So maybe one approach is, um, and I think we do need to meet with it with the experts. Um, you know, I, I've I've read from here to equality. I think it's a brilliant book. Uh, I think Sandy Darity and Kristen Mullen uh, have have done a remarkable achievement. Um, but like with any expert that we use, uh, we they should be everybody should be vetted. We should discuss it. And we should meet with them on something so fundamental. So maybe one approach is to um, have a meeting where we, we meet with the experts, um, uh, have the ability to question and, and, and get to know them and understand, you know, uh, what their feelings and to have them provide us with some guidance. We then um, go into uh, a session without them It'd still be a public meeting, but basically we would, you know, commence the discussion about, I think, what um, Professor Scott Lewis is talking about in terms of the issue of eligibility. And we, we discuss it and, and we sort of map out the parameters of, of what that would be. Um, and then assuming we can, can vote on that and, and begin to shape what the approach might be in in either in a specific a manner as the task force feels uh, it can do, then we would uh, be meeting directly, or it could be a, ta a a committee, an advisory committee, meeting with the, with the experts to then fashion uh, the next steps, which would be a more which would be the scope of work, and then that that the scope of work would serve as a roadmap. Or basically what they're going to study. So it's kind of a two-step process. You know, meet meet the experts, the task force basically figuring out this very difficult issue, and then a advisory committee meeting working with the experts to further map out the scope of work and then produce the work. Thank you for that. Uh, Vice Chair Brown, you're recognized. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Ladies and gentlemen, when do we agendize and settle the issue of eligibility? When? Member Montgomery stepped. Yeah, thank you. I I, um, I think I'm trying to distinguish in my head what decisions we make as a task force before we go into the next step. And so I think that's on us. And in my mind, I didn't think an advisory committee um, was going to prohibit us from being able to make uh, the decisions that we are charged to make, um, you know, um, via the bill and so i um i guess i wasn't clear on i feel like there's um this feeling that that an advisory committee would be deciding these things for us when i just looked at it as um a couple representatives from the task force that will be working with the economists um these are all, these very grave big decisions there's no way that i would want to put that into the hands of two of us, right? And I don't think any of us would want to do that. So I guess maybe more clarity on what the uh, function of the advisory committee would be. And then number two, what decisions do we have to make that we know now <laughs> as a task force um, before we go into that next step 
with the group of economists. And that also would be something that an advisory committee could bring to us um, so that we can um, agendize accordingly. So I, I just uh, didn't think that an advisory committee would, would have the deciding, be able to decide for all of us how we're gonna deal with these issues. Uh, Madam Chair, my, my question still was not answered. The question was, since we appear to be balling it over this issue of the economics reparation in that we have not determined the eligibility for reparation. What's the basic? What's the first thing first? Member Scott Lewis, you Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Brown, did you want to finish what you said? I didn't mean to cut you off. I'm saying the task force has the responsibility of making that decision. And my question is, why is it that we appear to be, appear to be hesitant about making that decision? I can answer you, Member Brown. Um, it's just that we haven't moved to agenda item number 22 yet. And so that, that gets exactly answered once we move to the next agenda item. Um, and so, I mean, it feels like it's clear that we are ready to do that. Um, <clears throat> so perhaps that, that's what we should do. Uh, you know, so what I will say as, as one of the advisory committee members alongside Chair Moore, for the future, <clears throat> the future meetings, uh, you know, we have this 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 exact point on the schedule to be discussed. Um, we need to, you know, move to that to to decide exactly where it should go. Um, so that's what we that's what we need to do collectively, and we could do that. I mean, we are supposed to be doing that this meeting. Um, you know, what I will just say in addition, in response to uh, Member Montgomery Stepp's question is. Is that the you know the economist team is going to ask a lot of questions and those questions that they ask are going to presume a lot of authority um, from the advisory committee and so the issue is that and these are not decisive questions these are just like so how are we defining right what the no as I mentioned earlier what the notion of injury means in this case or that case and so it's important that we have a good sense uh, as a task force who could then effectively give that guidance to the advisory committee, who can then carry the task force, uh, the task force's guidance into the, their discussion with the um, economics, um, economics experts. Uh, you know, what I will say is, is that um, the, the meetings so far have, I think, done a lot of the work in terms of thinking about the areas of inquiry that the, the economics experts will need to look into. How do we quantify, how do they quantify the various injuries that we've been addressing across the course of our meetings so far? The missing issue is just a question of eligibility, right? That is the intersecting issue. Um, and so as soon as we can decide that, then I think we will you know, have accomplished the lion's share of, of, of determining the scope of work, um, at least in a general sense, as a set of guidance that we can provide to the economics experts. And at that point, I think, you know, an advisory committee working with the economics experts will be, you know, will have a certain sense of, of you know, um, confidence in, in, in what kind of, uh, kind of feedback they're giving to, to that panel. Okay. Thank you, Member Lewis. Um, I'll, I'll go to Attorney Newman again to just further clarify um, essentially what you just said, <laughs> Member Lewis, but to also uh, uh, to Montgomery Stepp's question um, as to the role and function of the advisory committee, given that uh, we still have a motion on the floor. Sure, um, I'm happy to do so. Um, so I, I think, Essentially, everyone is correct in what they've said. These are the ultimate decisions that lie with the task force as a whole. Those, those decisions couldn't be delegated to, to an uh, advisory committee. An advisory committee can't actually carry out the role of the task force as a whole 
An advisory committee is simply a way for the task force to delegate to two members just to handle some of the heavy load and heavy lift of some of these issues to prep them for consideration for the task force. So, for example, um, um, Member Tamaki and Member Holder are on the subpoena advisory committee. They do not have the ability to issue subpoenas on behalf of the task force absent a vote of the task force because they are only an advisory committee. That's different than if, say, one person was delegated the obligation, which would allow that one person to carry out the duties of the task force on their own. In other words, if there was one person handling the subpoenas with the Department of Justice, we could work with that one person and then just go ahead and issue subpoenas on their instructions. We can't do that with two members. Those two members need to come back and report back, as, as Member Tamaki and Member Holder have been doing, to the task force for a vote of the whole task force um, in order to get authority to move forward. That being said, the motion right now is, is not um, for the advisory committee to make any of these determinations <laughs> with regard to what the ultimate decisions of the task force are gonna be uh, as to who is eligible, what forms reparation should take, and um, how reparation should be allocated. The, the question is, we need to go ahead and retain these experts. We have the Department of Justice has to go through the retention process and figure out contracts and all that stuff. Um, and in order for the task force to be able to vote as to whether the task force wants to proceed with this expert group, um, meaning this group, we've talked about five, five members of this expert group um, with a scope of work that contemplates a process for the task force to get the advice and consultation of the experts in terms of how they should make those, those decisions. For example, if you're looking at um, who is eligible, the task force will have to vote on who is eligible a member, um, Scott Lewis, a member, and Chair Moore will present a plan for getting to some of those decisions uh, when we're done with this agenda item. But part of that is having the experts provide advice if the task force wants it on those questions. So that would be part of the scope of work. Um, theoretically, it could also just be testimony that you ask them in open meetings. But the idea here is for that to be part of the scope of work that they would agree to as, as a whole, and then proceed pursuant to that scope of work all the way through the drafting of report two, which would express the opinion of the task force as a whole. So the, the advisory committee contemplated here is not to reach any of those um, ultimate questions. Um, that being said, it is also perfectly reasonable for the task force to have these kinds of discussions as to who should be on the um, expert team, what the expert team should be tasked with, um, and what, most importantly, what issues members of the task force feel like they want to hear from the expert team about. If the task force feels like you want to have a vote and just decide what the community of eligibility is, then maybe you don't need the task force, the uh, expert committee to um, weigh in on that, the expert team to provide recommendations or provide analysis or support you in coming to that decision. If you're able to make that decision yourselves, then you don't need the expert team. Um, so it's really just working through those, that example, that's one of probably a dozen different issues that need to be resolved as we work toward a scope of work of what you really want this expert team to be working on on your behalf, advising you um, getting to the final recommendation. So um, I think, you know, it's everyone's correct. There's not, there's no one right answer or anything like that. Um, it's just something that'll be up to you all to decide how you want to manage. And again, this is just the part of the work that involves um, just agreeing that these are the experts that you want, um, that this is the expert team that you want helping you all in coming to this final decisions and your recommendations, and then how you want to get that assistance from them through the scope of work.
Okay, so there there is a motion on the floor for this advisory committee. Um, I just want to provide space for, you know, a motion to be withdrawn or for us to um, just do the, you know, take the vote on this advisory committee so that we can move forward with the next agenda item, which is about uh, future hearings. So, how about this? Um, so there's been a motion, there's been a second, and I'll just restate the motion, and then we can just go to a vote and see where that goes. So the motion is to create an advisory committee that'll work alongside the California Department of Justice Research Center, um, in addition to the individual, five individuals named, to develop a scope of work with these five individuals. Um, to bring back to the task force for a further discussion. So that's the motion on the floor. Um, and again, the survivor committee wouldn't have any, you know, um, sole authority to make any decisions on behalf of the task force. Um, okay, so Parliamentarian Johnson, um, may you please um, establish a roll call vote for the motion yes. on the floor. Yes, I will. Uh, I will call the uh, vote. Call the roll for the vote on the motion on the floor. Uh, Chair Moore. Abstain. Chair Brown. I'm sorry, Vice Chair Brown. You're on mute. Vice Chair Brown, you're on mute. Yes. Thank you. Please repeat your vote. I didn't. Yes. Thank you. Vice Chair Brown votes aye. Member Bradford? Based on the level of readiness, I'm going to abstain. Member Bradford abstains. Member Grills? No. Member Grills votes nay. Member Holder? Member Holder? I mean, you're on mute. No. Member Holder votes nay. Member Jones Sawyer. Abstain. Member Jones Sawyer abstains. Member Lewis. Aye. Member Lewis votes aye. Member Tamaki. Abstain. Member Tamaki abstains. Member Montgomery Step. Aye. Member Montgomery Step votes aye. Um, Madam Chair, nine members voted. There were three ayes, two nays, and four abstentions. Okay, so the motion fails. Um, no, no, there are three eyes, two names, yeah. and four okay, so abstentions. Don't, don't, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Spoke. So the eyes have it, so we'll uh, develop an advisory committee. Um, so before we move on to the next agenda item, I think it would be important for us to identify who these two members would be. Um, and so we probably would need to do another motion for that. Um, I don't, I don't mind volunteering myself. Um, member, Mon um, uh, member Jovan Scott Lewis um, has also volunteered. Um, is anyone else interested? I can abstain and take myself out of this as well. <laughs> okay, so um, member Lewis, do you, um, would you like to, you know, put a motion on the floor related to the committee? Sure. Thank you. <laughs> I move that myself, Member Lewis, and Chair Moore uh, compose the advisory committee to the A second motion. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so it has been properly moved and seconded that uh, Member Scott Lewis and myself, Chairperson Moore, um, establish an advisory committee comprising of ourselves. 
to uh, work alongside the DOJ Research Center and the five individuals named to develop a, a scope of work uh, for the economic consultancy position. Is there any discussion on the matter? <clears throat> um, Member Tamaki, you're recognized. Yeah, yeah just a short comment. <clears throat> I, I, I mean, I really anticipate, I, I think the idea of having two person, uh, both Chair Moore and Javon Scott Lewis is great to get the ball rolling. We have to move forward. But I also anticipate the economists saying, well, what's the, wh how big the universe is? And then I anticipate, you know, a sharpening of that discussion, but then ultimately bringing it back to the task force because that that is our prerogative. That's what everybody is saying. That's what Michael Newman is saying. That's what everybody believes. And at that point, there'll be a pretty robust discussion about what the universe of remedies are going to be, which in turn will inform the, the advisory committee and the experts that this is the will of the task force. Um, but in that process, you know, we're, we'll get to know the experts and, and I, the task force members uh, in, I presume there'll be a presentation of some kind just to get the ball rolling. and. You know, at that point, uh, Professor Grills and um, Member Holder and, and some of the others, me, you know, we'll, we'll ask questions. Uh, but I, I think I think that's a good process to get it going. But I, I, I you know, it's kind of like, what do we do first? And it, it makes sense that the advisory committee goes forward, but then I anticipate it coming back to the task force because it has to. So just, just a comment. Hey, um, this is me be doing my due diligence. If I'm, if we're going to be on this advisory committee, I know there was a comment made about potential conflicts of interest um, for the tasks uh, for these individuals named, and so I'm just opening space. Um, if anyone wants to kind of ex articulate what that means, which might be helpful for us, for members Scott Lewis and I to kind of communicate back to the research center and these five individuals um, that could inform our work with the, developing the scope of work. Are there any other comments or questions, if not on the conflict of interest comment made? Okay, hearing no further discussion, I will, I will go to Parliamentarian Johnson so that a roll call vote may be established. Thank you. Voting on the motion to establish the members of the advisory committee. Chair Moore. Aye. Vice Chair Brown. Aye. Member Bradford. Aye. Member Grills. Aye. Member Holder. Aye. Member Jones Sawyer. Aye. Member Scott Lewis. Aye. Member, excuse me, Tamaki? Aye. Member Montgomery Stepp? Aye. Madam Chair, there were nine members voting, nine ayes, no nays. Thank you. There are nine ayes, no nays. The ayes have it, and so the motion carries. An advisory committee will be established, which will comprise of myself and Member Scott Lewis. So we'll now move on to the next item on our agenda, which is. Um, Potential action items scheduled for future meetings of the task force, presentation by myself and member Scott Lewis. Um, can the California Department of Justice staff uh, put onto the screen um, the future hearing proposal um, that member Scott Lewis and I came up with for the benefit of the public and the task force members, please? If you don't have it handy, I can try to um, use my screen. Please let me know. I'm getting it up right now. Thank you very much. And then once the presentation is on our screen, I'll, I'll let member Scott Lewis um, take the lead.
Okay, thank you, Chair Moore. Uh, I'm assuming everybody else can see the proposed schedule. So as you see here at the top, um, we are in our current meeting uh, for January 2022. So what's important to note is that Chair Moore and I were tasked with um, not only determining the locations of our future meetings, um, but to try and sketch out the topics of those future meetings. And what's important to note is that according to our original um, schedule of, of, of meetings, uh, as initially proposed by the DOJ at the beginning of the life of the task force, um, where we are in that original schedule would be um, around meeting six out of 10 meetings. So as everyone knows, um, because we've been, we've been uh, virtual up until this point, um, we uh, agreed a, a couple of meetings ago that we would count um, or begin counting our 10 meetings that were provided to us uh, by the state um, once we began meeting in person. And so there's a great deal of variability in what the schedule looks like going forward, uh, depending on when we actually move to in-person meetings. So what we have on the screen right now is that the February meeting and the March meeting, because of Gavin, uh, Governor, <laughs> Governor uh, Gavin Newsom's um, um, extension on the on the <clears throat> of the requirement to meet virtually, um, the next two meetings are uh, planned to be virtual. So what what we have to do as a task force is decide uh, if that is in fact uh, lifted, not continued. Um, one, are we comfortable beginning meeting? Uh, in the, the months that follow, um, or do we want to uh, remain in a virtual format? The other thing that we have to note is that <clears throat> according to the original schedule, we would actually be, you know, we would be left with only four meetings, right? However, because of the circumstances of the way that we've, we've planned our meetings and, and, and held our meetings, we actually have, um, you know, eight more meetings or so remaining. Uh, sorry, was there a point? I can't see everybody, let me, okay. So what we need to do is we need to, as a task force, one, decide uh, on the timing of those meetings. We need to decide on the location of those meetings once we move to in-person, and we need to decide uh, finally on the subjects of those meetings. Uh, based upon based upon the discussion that we've just had, it seems um, seems appropriate to put the question of eligibility on next month's meeting. That would be my recommendation, but this is for us to decide. So what I will do very quickly before before we move to to discussion is quickly go over what Chair Moore and I have come up with. Um, so it was actually recommended by one of the members of the DOJ that we we um, commemorate Black History Month in a February meeting. Um, so at the moment, we have that as a proposed activity. And the idea there um, is to highlight the, the, you know, the current and past reparations advocates, as well as receiving a report update um, from the DOJ. The, and I might ask uh, Michael Newman later to come and, and, and say something about the timing of the review of the report and approval of the report and what impact that will actually have on the schedule. Uh, we have uh, in March a proposal to discuss criminal justice as that was on our original schedule and we've yet to, to address that issue. Um, that would take place in March. Then in April, we would have our first in-person meeting, which we are proposing to be held in San Francisco. Uh, which was a decision uh, that we agreed upon uh, as initially uh, suggested by Member Brown. At that meeting in April, one of our, one of our biggest uh, tasks will be to actually um, discuss, discuss the report and have a final report approval um, so that it can be released in June. Uh, <clears throat> The other point in April is that we would discuss on how to educate the California public on findings using that report as um, using the approval of the report, the discussion around the approval of the report as our, you know, let's say a, a kind of proper attempt at deciding how we are going to actually communicate what we've discussed over the past several months of meetings uh, to the California public. 
And of course, it's important to remember that that task is provided uh, to us as a requirement in Article 2 of the AB 3121 bill. So the report or report one will be released on June 1. The next meeting would then be held in July, and that would then be in Los Angeles. The, sorry, let me just, this, I need to expand it on my screen. Okay. So then the, the discussion of the report, uh, the release report, there's a celebration of, of the report, a discussion about the, the report and the findings and the preliminary recommendations will be held um, in that July meeting. And then, you know, prior to, to, to Dr. Weber's visit um, yesterday, uh, Chair Moran, I thought that the July meeting would be a, a good time to finally discuss the issue of eligibility. Um, but as I mentioned, I personally would recommend moving that up to our February meeting. Uh, what that would then represent is our pivot to stage two of the task force, um, where we would then begin to hear testimony and to begin to debate um, and deliberate, um, uh, or at least have preliminary deliberation on the actual issue of what our reparations re recommendation might be. Um, could you go to the next page, please? So as you would have seen that the September meeting where we would begin to discuss the issue of reparations, understanding um, and having testimony on various models of reparations, the recommendation was to have that take place um, in the historical black uh, town area of Allensworth, uh, moving the meeting to its first Central California location. Then after that, the recommendation or the suggestion is to uh, have our November meeting in Sacramento, where we would discuss the issue of reparation and restitution and restoration. Uh, <clears throat> then moving to January 2023, we would move back to Southern California, um, to San Diego, where we would discuss the issue of compensation. Then after that, we would come up again to Oakland, where we would start with what we are, what Chair Moore and I decided were the kind of the two parts of extensive and intentional deliberation. We're very mindful of the fact that we did not want to get to a place where we were left in the last meeting uh, to discussing exactly what the proposals were going to be. So we wanted for there to be significant time or at least sufficient time um, to actually discuss our recommendations and to actually bring debate around the question of reparations and what we're proposing uh, to, to the meeting. And so in February of 23, in Oakland, we are proposing something that we're calling Reparations Recommendations Part 1. And then in April of 2023, we are suggesting uh, holding our meeting then in Inglewood, where we would take part in Reparations Recommendations Part 2. As you can see from the, uh, the bulleted items, uh, we would be thinking about very specific remedies, very specific uh, recommendations and we will be dedicating our, our, our time to discussing them. And then June 2023, we uh, suggested to move the final meeting to Sacramento, which we thought it was appropriate um, given its location, um, where we would have a presentation and then approval of the second report. Uh, Chair Moore, if you have anything to add, please go ahead. Thank you for that. Um, so. The only thing I would add is um, the only thing that I would add is what we can do is you know the task force we can take uh, comments or questions and insights based on the information presented, but I also wanted to provide an option or alternative where the task force can you know vote to approve let's say the agenda for um, you know February and March, and then as an advisory committee um, you know. Uh, Javon and I, a member Scott Lewis and I can kind of return back to the task force um, next month and kind of rework this um, based on any comments or insights that you all have today. So that's all I would have to add. Scott Lewis, does, is, is there anything else? Is, does that sound right? I can't see anyone, so. Um, <laughs> 
<laughs> and just for reference, um, in the meeting materials, uh, this this proposal is on uh, page two hundred one. Oh, you wanted us to pull it up and 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 see it firsthand without having to look on the screen. Since we can't see each other, can can I speak, Chair Moritz Don Tamaki? Yes, Member Tamaki. <clears throat> so, Please. what would help me a lot is to start setting the dates of these meetings, um, because the longer we wait to set those dates, the more difficult it is. I, I'm sure everybody's calendar starts to fill up, and it makes planning really, really difficult. So, I don't know how how you all feel about that or the Department of Justice, but for me, you know, putting these dates up and, you know, and fixing them so that we, you know, schedule around them or, you know, know that we're going to have a quorum, I think that's, that's important to me. Um, yes, so Attorney Newman can actually speak to the quorum dates. I believe we have some. Attorney Newman? Yes, sure. So a couple of things. First is um, we do have some quorum dates. They are informed by your responses to the doodle poll. I'll just remind you all um, and member Tamaki to your point in order to plan ahead. We really do need the members availability and the members responses to those uh, doodle polls. Um, that's what we go off of in order to gain uh, to gain availability. Also clarify one thing about the virtual or versus in-person issue, um, which is uh, member Scott Lewis and, and Chair Moore um, laid out meetings starting in March, would be, which would be after the expiration of the governor's um, order. Um, and I mentioned this yesterday in my DOJ updates. One of the things we'll want to do um, is get the task force's um, decision on if an emergency order is extended after um, the previous meeting, so meaning after the March meeting, but before the April meeting, um, we would like to get a vote from the task force as to whether there is a preference to retain the in-person meeting or to shift to virtual oh, based on the extension of the executive order. Um, and that would be important because we'll need to make those, we'll we need to include that in the notice. Um, so looking at the February meeting, and I don't know, uh, uh, member Scott Lewis or Chair Moore, if you want to get m into more detail of the plan of the February meeting, but the February meeting, um, I think the plan is for it to potentially be one day and you have quorum dates on February 22nd, 23rd and 24th, and I will make a note that um, the task force has asked for us to have uh, Professor Erwin Chemerinsky provide testimony, and we um, have his available dates as February 23rd and 24th, which are also quorum dates. So either of those dates would work if we wanted him to be a part of the meeting uh, as you've envisioned it um, for February. So. Just to recap, February 22nd, 23rd, and 24th, um, but 23rd and 24th of the dates, Professor Chemerinsky are available. Um, then I'll also say that in March, uh, the quorum dates are March 28th, 29th, and 30th. And we believe we also have Professor Chemerinsky available on March 29th or 30th when you have a quorum. And those are the those are all of the quorum dates for a potentially one day meeting um, in February and a two day meeting in March. Thank you, Attorney Newman. And just to um, the veggie back off of what he just said. Um, in terms of what uh, Member Scott Lewis and I and, and the DOJ was, were thinking about and for our February meeting, that it would be a one-day meeting to commemorate Black History Month. But um, during the meeting, we would have um, a discussion or celebration of um, reparations advocates um, in the past, 
um, and in the present. And then we were also thinking of having Dean Tremorinsky, you know, as part of her, his, his expert testimony on the community of eligibility, maybe also give a more broader lecture on you know, constitutional law and reconstruction and how that relates to uh, repertory justice efforts, particularly in California. And then, of course, in March uh, would be our, you know, as scheduled public hearing plan, I mean, public hearing on mass incarceration, war on drugs, um, and the criminal legal system, as well as hate crimes. Um, and so, um, as again, we, I can't see anybody, so I, I put in the moderator chat if we could just um, move uh, this, the, the paper off screen temporarily yeah, for now. Great. Thank you. Um, so, yes, member holder, I see. Um, uh, no, I was just gonna ask you if you could just put the first page up really quick for a second. Yes. Okay, I'm good. So I just have a clarifying question for Attorney Newman. So, you know, with this discussion, would it be helpful if we voted on particular specific dates right now, today, or is this something that, right, for February and March, or is this something we, we could do offline, given that we already have some dates to, we would probably um, have to. Well, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Uh, so I think first, first and foremost, there's two things that I think we need to vote on. Um, one of them is uh, whether the February, what what form the February meeting takes. That's sort of the next thing, the next agenda item. We keep popping through agenda items, but the next agenda item is setting the agenda for the next meeting. We currently have the March meeting up there because that's what's in the original plan. But of course, um, you're proposing a February meeting, whether that's one day or two days. I think the task force needs to take that up and then just to confirm the dates so that everyone can plan and frankly, so that we can then go start planning for the witnesses in February. But we'd also like to set the date for March. So that we can, because that's going to be the the subject matter of that meeting is is going to be pretty jammed. So we'll want to start working on those experts as well. And I'm just we're just trying to confirm that there might actually be more quorum dates in February for a one day meeting, potentially 23, 24, 25, and 26, which is a Saturday. Um, but reconfirming um, Professor Chimerinsky's Availability is still the 23rd and the 24th. I know I'm throwing a bunch of dates and information out. So if we take it sort of in order, I think first is the yeah. question of whether you want to have um, one day a one day topic. meeting um, as you've conceived that's split between somewhat ceremonial memorial. And then the second half, which is as member Scott Lewis mentioned before, a critical date, which is we do need to set aside time in the February meeting for you all to evaluate and consult with the D with the DOJ on the draft of the task force's report. Yeah. So, are there any thoughts on whether what we should do, whether February should be a one day meeting um, or two day meeting? Member Lewis, Matt Lewis. I think February needs to be a two day meeting. Um, and I say that because I think it's appropriate for us to spend, you know, one day or part of a day um, commemorating Black History Month. Um, we do have to discuss the the draft of the report, and as I mentioned earlier, I think it's it's an appropriate time to finalize the eligibility question. Um, and so those those three three issues require two days. Um, and I was I didn't I'm not sure if I missed, but I was on I was unaware of Dean Chemerinsky's availability in February. So um, on those days. So if he's available, then that that marks to me an appropriate time to have that discussion uh, around eligibility, given that he has some view on, on the matter. Okay. 
So then that would mean that the meeting would have to be um, the February 23rd and 24th, because those are the, the only dates in February that Dean Chimmerman's schedule we know is available. 